Hello again. <clears throat> I want us to spend some time now thinking about how I can take a graph and the line that I made from my graph to create what I'm going to call a mathematical model that represents the pattern of the, the relationship of my data points. So I collect data points to make a graph, and then I can turn that graph into a mathematical relationship between the variables on my graph. So I'm going to start with, <clears throat> excuse me, the same graph of circumference versus diameter that we were looking at previously. <clears throat> and if we take that graph where we found that the slope previously, we found that the slope was for every one centimeter of diameter, I'll get 3.1 centimeters of circumference. And so, yes, even though it is mathematically valid to divide out the centimeters over centimeters and say the slope is 3.1, I think we can find a lot more physics conceptual meaning if we leave that slope as there are 3.1 centimeters of circumference gained for every one centimeter of diameter increase. And so to leave those units there. But if I want to turn this into a mathematical relationship, first of all, I'll point out that the graph that we made there is a line. Now, you have already studied straight lines in math classes, and I'm going to guess that you are already familiar with knowing that the equation of a straight line I see here at the bottom of the screen, y equals m times x plus b. Y equals mx plus b is a familiar thing, should be, I would hope, from math classes. And what we mean when we say y equals mx plus b, and you notice maybe that I color-coded at the bottom of the screen there, I made the y and the x blue, I made the m and the b red. So y and x in this context are our two variables on the graph. Y is the vertical variable, the circumference in this case x is the horizontal variable, the independent variable, the diameter in this case. We're looking at how the circumference depends on the diameter. So y, that's our dependent variable, in this case circumference. x is our independent variable, in this case that's diameter. And the red m, m is for the slope of the graph. We've already calculated that number. B, you might remember from math class, is what we call the y-intercept. That's when the independent variable is zero, where our graph hits the vertical axis, the y-axis. That's the number where it crosses that axis, where the graph crosses that axis. So let's say, just for fun, um, I found a y-intercept of 0 0.22 centimeters. It's close to the origin, close to zero, but not quite. So I want to make a mathematical relationship here. And I'm going to start, because I know that this is a straight line, I'm going to start with y equals mx plus b. If my graph is not a straight line, and we are going to sooner or later meet graphs that are not straight lines, and we'll deal with those in their own way. But for right now, since this graph is a straight line, then y equals mx plus b tells the story. But I want to turn this into a story about circumference and diameter. So what I'm going to do then, I'm going to replace all four of those, y, m, x, and b. The y and the x in this box down here. The y and the x, I color coded this. I'm going to replace those generic math terms with something meaningful about this specific graph, about this specific relationship. And so in place of the generic y, I'm going to put the actual dependent variable, the circumference. And in place of the generic x, that just means whatever the independent variable is, I'm going to put in the actual independent variable for this experiment, the diameter. So I hope you can see on the screen that I replaced the y and the x with c for circumference and d for diameter. Because again, I want to tell a story about this graph, and this is not a graph about y's and x's. This is a graph about circumferences and diameters. And I'm going to replace the m with the actual number of the slope. The two red things are numbers that belong to this specific line. So I'm going to replace the two red M and B with the actual numbers that fit my graph.
So I'm replacing the M with 3.1 centimeters for every one centimeter. And I'm replacing the B with 0 0.22 centimeters because it's not quite zero. And every single time you make an equation, you make some mathematical relationship from your graph. If we've got a straight line, there's a Y, an M, an X, and a B, you are going to replace all four of those things. You will not leave Y or X. You will not leave M or B. You're going to make replacements for Y and X of what is the actual independent variable? What is the actual dependent variable for the X and the Y? And you're going to replace the actual numbers for slope and Y intercept. Although you might be thinking, looking at that mathematical relationship, that that 0.22 centimeters doesn't really make sense to you. And it doesn't make sense to me either. I would expect, if I'm making this graph, I would expect that the y-intercept should be zero. And I would expect that the y-intercept should be zero because if I try making a circle that has no diameter, then it should have no circumference also. If I make a circle that has no size, then it should have no circumference. So I expect my y-intercept to be zero, but I didn't get zero. So sometimes it turns out that what we're measuring isn't quite what we thought we were measuring. And sometimes even when we expect one thing, the reality is something else. And also though, we have to face the facts that the data that we collect is imperfect. We know that all of our data is imperfect. And so I use some computer software to come up with a best fit line. And you soon will get some practice with using computer software to make a best fit line. And when you do that, then the best fit is going to be calculated by a computer. And so instead of just eyeballing it, the computer is going to tell you this is the exact best fit. And you're going to find y-intercepts that aren't zero when you think that they should be. And so a question that's important to us is, did I get zero for a y-intercept because that software was working with imperfect data? And that's just an imperfection of my data showing up as a y-intercept? Or is there something to the y-intercept that it really isn't zero? A way that we in this class are going to deal with this is we're going to use something that we'll call the 5% rule. Now, this is not something that professional scientists do. And if you find yourself working as a professional scientist, then along the way, you'll learn better tools. But for right now, this is good enough. So the 5% rule, what we're going to do is we're going to take 5% of the highest number on our vertical axis. And looking back up here at this graph, I can see that the highest number on the vertical axis, the y-axis, the circumference axis, is 54 centimeters. So what I'm going to do for this 5% rule is I'm going to calculate what's 5% of 54 centimeters. And I get 2.7 centimeters. So if the absolute value of my y-intercept is smaller than 5%, then it's probably safe to round that to zero it's probably a small enough amount that's just because of imperfections in our data collection. If it's larger than 5%, then maybe we need to either accept that we have a y-intercept that isn't zero and figure out why, or maybe we need to figure out a way to collect more accurate data if we're really sure that it ought to be zero. But if it's higher than 5%, if our y-intercept is higher than 5%, then we can't ignore it. If it's smaller than 5%, then it's safe to round it down to zero. So in this situation, since that 0 0.22 centimeters is way less than 5% of my highest number, then I can just round off that y-intercept to zero. So coming back to that equation, then instead of saying circumference equals 3.1 centimeters for every one centimeter times diameter plus that 0.22 centimeters, I can just make that a plus zero. And writing plus zero, I might as well not even bother. And so I could simplify that equation in the end as just saying circumference equals 3.1 centimeters for every one centimeter times diameter. And if you hadn't noticed it by now, then maybe 
now is a good time to notice that this really is just that equation circumference equals pi times diameter, where we figured that out experimentally. And really, this is how people figured out that relationship between circumference and diameter in the first place so many years ago. Experimentally, I got something really close to that. And if we had made more accurate measurements, then we would get a slope closer and closer and closer to pi. So let's take another look at a different situation. If I am calculating the slope of this graph that I made for putting marbles in a cup, the slope is 3.7 grams for every one marble based on my calculations previously. And I want to make a mathematical model out of this as well. And so I'm going to take that equation y equals mx plus b and I'm going to replace the y and the x with total mass for the y because that's the variable, my, in, my dependent variable is the total mass. So I'll replace y with the total mass and I'll replace x with number of marbles. I don't want to put words in, I'll use symbols, we'll see soon. Um, I have a slope. Um, also, there's a y-intercept here, and we should think about the y-intercept. Does that round off? Does that y-intercept round to zero or no? So if I got a y-intercept of 7.1 grams, um, if we say that the maximum number on this axis was, it's close enough, we can call that 95 grams. Then using the 5% rule, 5% 5 of 95 grams is 4.75 grams. 7.1 grams is higher than that. So since the y-intercept is more than 5% of that highest number, I don't feel good about rounding that off to zero. Also in this situation, I think that I shouldn't be rounding it off to zero. I think for this situation that uh, the y-intercept does have some physical meaning, and I want you to be thinking about that. Um, the y-intercept does mean something. Like, And when we think about a y-intercept, that's when the independent variable is zero. So when my independent variable number of marbles is zero, why would there be a total mass? You can think on that, but let's get back to making this mathematical model. Let's write an equation from y equals mx plus b. My mathematical model, it's a straight line graph, y equals mx plus b, but y is the total mass. Instead of writing out the words total mass, I'm just going to use a capital M for mass. Um, that little m, the slope, is the average marble mass. My deep, my independent variable, sorry, my independent variable is how many marbles, looking back at that graph, number of marbles. So I'll say N for number of marbles. And then my y-intercept, um, and I hadn't meant to spoil it, but then I spoiled it. So um, if we think about what would be the meaning of the mass when there are zero marbles in the cup, since our scale always had the cup on it, then what's the mass of cup plus marbles when you have zero marbles? That's the mass of the cup. And I think that that's worth noticing that this graph shows me the mass of the cup in terms of that y-intercept and the steepness as I add more and more and more marbles, then the average steepness, and if you had different size marbles in your experiment, then you didn't always have like a steady increase, but that can tell us at least then the average mass of a marble. For every one marble I add, here's how much more mass there will be. And so replacing the Y and the X with mass and number of marbles, replacing the slope with 3.6 grams for every one marble, and replacing the y-intercept with 7.1 grams. Now I have a mathematical model. And now with this mathematical model, I could do all kinds of awesome things. Like I could predict if I add 700 marbles to that cup, if I could fit them all, 
how much mass would that be? Or how many marbles will I need to add if I wanted to get this up to 500 grams? I could use that mathematical relationship, that equation to do that. And that is an incredibly powerful tool to be able to make predictions about things we haven't even done.